corporate purpose has really evolved, moving beyond profit to really encompass broader human ideals and societal contributions. Things like Nike, Apple, Starbucks, Southwest Airlines, Harley-Davidson, Lululemon, Patagonia today, what they've all done is they've cohered their stakeholders, their ecosystem of people who can make their company successful. In a world brimming with diverse voices and perspectives, the role of businesses in fostering unity becomes not just beneficial but essential. Don't start with a political issue or a social issue and see how, what you can do about it. Start with a human ideal. What do you believe in? As we gear up to explore the transformative power of aligning businesses with human ideals, it's crucial for, to remember the impact that purpose-driven leadership can have. Leading a small business that doesn't want to be a small business and you want to grow, one of the best ways to grow has always been giving people a reason to help you grow. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Canadian SME Small Business Podcast, where we delve deep into the essential aspects that fuel our community's backbone, the small businesses. I'm your host, Maheen, and we're here to navigate today's conversation on the intersection of leadership, social movements, and commerce, a trifecta that's really reshaping the commercial landscape. Today, we're uncovering how ideals and beliefs shape business strategies and the impact of unified purpose in today's fragmented society. We're quite honored to have Mike Robitaille with us today as the leader of Deloitte Isaac's Reputation Services. As a visionary in marketing strategies, Mike brings an unparalleled depth of knowledge on aligning business practices with societal ideals. His work in founding one of Canada's fastest growing and agencies leading Deloitte's Purpose Group underscores his commitment to enhancing organizational momentum through purpose and leadership. So let's dive into the insights with Mike uh, that has garnered through uh, his illustrious career. Good afternoon, Mike, and welcome to the Canadian SME Small Business Podcast. How are you today? I'm doing great, Mahin. Thanks so much for having me, and thanks so much for the interest in the topic. It's great pleasure to have you with us here, Mike, and we're quite excited uh, to get your expertise on on how businesses can really navigate through the complexities of uh, today's social dynamics, right? And we're quite eager to hear your perspectives on such pressing issues. Now, to kick things started uh, or to kick things off, let's kind of focus on society's fragmentation and its implementation for business. Now, in this digital age, uh, which has brought in unprecedented levels of access to information, uh, reshaping power dynamics and often leading to societal fragmentation. Uh, Mike, could you elaborate on what you've observed uh, regarding society becoming more fractured and what your findings suggest for businesses? Sure, sure. Um, so I, I think it, it's not so much a personal observation. I think we all sort of sense two things that have really happened that have dramatically shifted. You could say upended, call it the power dynamic in society. So one is just unfettered access to information prior to the ability to sort of go online and and find out whether a story that was being told by a company or a government or any entity, whether that was true or not, was very difficult because companies and governments had large control over how much information was going to be distributed, and there wasn't really recourse for people to look further. That's thoroughly changed now, whether it's a company and an advertisement or a country making a statement, people can go online and say, I wonder if there's more or less to that story. Mm -hmm. That's point number one. And point number two is social technologies have shifted immense power to groups and individuals that for the most part, corporations and governments were able to um, not heed as much, right? So if a small group of employees was disgruntled or a community was disgruntled, you could sort of keep operating and you could keep running and with relatively little interference. Today, a small group of employees goes online and complains or a group of customers or a group of vendors or a community of operation or whatever that stakeholder group might happen to be. Mm -hmm. And they push and pull your company in all sorts of different directions because those groups aren't homogenous either. Right. Like employee groups, there are subgroups and they want this. and won't. So it's become very, very difficult for companies, leaders of companies or countries to cohere people in a direction. It used to be sort of a function of near consolidated control and you were able to command people in a direction. And now you actually have to earn their support to move in a direction. And many leaders public sector, private sectors are struggling with that very issue. Mm -hmm. Now, to build on this a bit more, uh, Mike, how can businesses really navigate this fragmentation to maintain uh, and build stakeholder support? Yeah. So one of the wonderful things is, even though, call it the need is new and the, the problem 
relatively acute, like how do I organize my fragmented groups of stakeholders? Again, whether you're a public sector organization, a big company or a small company, how do I get employees, customers, allies, vendors, all of these groups behind what my company stands for? So that need might be new, but there is a very um, well-trodden pattern that you you actually can see in evidence in those companies that for the most part, all of us love, right? So mm -hmm. things like Nike, Apple, Starbucks, Southwest Airlines, Harley Davidson, Lululemon, Patagonia today, um, like what they've all done is they've cohered their stakeholders, their ecosystem of people who can make their company successful behind a human ideal. So, and it's really interesting. Like when you look at something like Nike, you know, like advertising, branding, people love to talk about how great their ads are and how great a brand they are. But it's really important to actually recognize them as something more than a brand. Mm -hmm. Like when we use the term brand for Coffee Crisp and Men and Speed Stick and Bud Light, those are great consumer brands, but they're really not the same as what's going on here. And when you look at what those companies have done, they're much more accurately described as founder-led cultural phenomena. Like we weren't, as human beings, we weren't exercising in personal fitness routines until a company came along and said, oh, if you're a human, then you've got a body, you're an athlete, get that body off the couch and just do it. And we did. Like they created a culture of fitness. We didn't have a place for me time. We all had home, a first place, work, a second place. Right. And then <laughs> Starbucks, a third place for me time. So these companies all change culture based on a human ideal. And, and that's the pattern. It's probably always like who doesn't want to be the president or an investor or an employee or a customer of those companies, right? Like is Patagonia just selling a polar fleece or are they selling a love of wild places and a desire to feel connected to nature? When you actually illuminate that higher meaning, you actually give people a common purpose to share that in being a part of these companies, we actually feel like we're bringing about the change we want to see in the world. Mm -hmm. And for small businesses, especially that's a pattern that's pretty invaluable. Like you can invent a great product or a great service, but that has commodity value. It has functional value. If you can add meaning to it, which is where these human ideals work, it's very hard for your competitor to replicate, but it's also the thing that's going to propel immense growth. Like what if you just go back to that same list of companies, um, like there is no ad agency or PR firm or management consultant that made Nike, Apple, Starbucks, Southwest Airlines, Harley David, the Patagonia, that made right. them these things. So it's not the conventional methods of demand creation. What they all have is unpaid promotion of stakeholders, human beings who say, oh my God, I love this company. I love working for it, or I love their, the way they treat me as a customer. And when you have human beings promoting it, it is a great factor for small businesses to introduce into how they become more competitive. If you have more people cheering for you to win, it's a great way to grow. Well, your your uh, emphasis on the societal fragmentation, it really um, offers uh, or provides a clear lens for which companies can really understand first their own role and second, uh, adopt strategies to really foster unity and support. Let's take a moment to reflect on what Mike shared about societal fragmentation. In a world brimming with diverse voices and perspectives, the role of businesses in fostering unity becomes not just beneficial, but essential. It's a powerful reminder that beyond transactions and profits, businesses have the potential to be the pillars of community and catalyst for cohesion. And talking about unity, we'd love to understand the, its critical role in small business success. Um, Mike, in a world where division seems more prevalent than ever, uh, the pursuit of unity within organizations and their communities holds a very newfound significance. Um, why do you believe unity matters so much for businesses today and what benefits does this bring? I think one of the fascinating things, just terminology, like we call these things businesses and companies, but we also call them organizations. And when you actually just think about it as an organization, like, yes, it's organized to be an instrument of profit growth, to be an instrument of economic value, but it's also organizing people. And if you don't give people something around which they can organize, because for a good 50, 60 years, all we really had to organize around was sell more stuff and make more money yeah. because shareholders were really the only stakeholder that had power over companies. But now all these other stakeholders have power and they're, they don't really care so much about 15 percent EBITDA growth per quarter. They don't care so much about return on capital employed and some of these financial metrics. So unless you actually illuminate 
something that all those groups can care about, a common purpose, a common ideal that they all can believe in and get behind, you're going to really struggle to actually be the thing you're supposed to be, which is an organization, something that does cohere different stakeholders who are all contributing to the success of your company. And so if you can't do that, you actually you run the great risk of actually being where many companies are today, where it's actually very fragmented groups. But if you can, like the force multiplier of people sharing a common purpose is immense. And, and you see it, whether it's military organizations or corporate organizations, when you have a bunch of people who believe in a common purpose. Right. Like when people want you to win, you become very hard to beat. There really is no greater force multiplier or competitive advantage than human beings caring about what you stand for, the change you can bring about in the world and wanting to contribute, wanting to be a part of it. Oh, it's great how you've highlighted that unity not only just contributes to <clears throat> achieving great success for the business, but it also contributes greatly to the cohesive society overall. As we gear up to explore the transformative power of aligning businesses with human ideals, it's crucial for to remember the impact that purpose-driven leadership can have. It's about more than just the bottom line. It's about an igniting collection movement towards common goals and shared dreams. So keep this in mind as Mike unfolds the significance of steering businesses with a compelling purpose that resonates deeply with every stakeholder involved. But Mike, uh, you know, I mean, reorienting businesses around human ideals is, is quite uh, useful as well. Now, the concept of, again, corporate purpose has really evolved, moving beyond profit to really encompass uh, broader human ideals and societal contributions. Uh, what drives the necessity for public and private organizations to align themselves with, uh, with the human ideal as their guiding principle? It, it's not an easy subject because, you know, as a result of this shift in social power. M most companies have call it run to this thing called corporate purpose. Mm. Um, but in doing so, we're really at the beginning of developing it as a discipline. It it's so important to actually say, so where are we at and how are we doing? And corporate purpose is one of the few things in business that it doesn't yet have a functional home. Right. So depending on the company, the topic can actually be held by marketing human resources, corporate affairs, sustainability, corporate strategy, or sometimes it's just floating above the company with the CEO. So what's interesting is it hasn't yet sort of found a home. Mm -hmm. what, even though it's relevant to all of those things, it actually hasn't found a home yet. And as a result, it's not doing all that well. Like 89% of CEOs are saying, I have a purpose statement, but I'm, I'm challenged to actually implement it, to action it, or make it relevant. So there are a lot of companies who know they have to do this, but their first attempt has not been successful. So, you know, my suggestion is, you know, try to find a sense of deep purpose. And there's a phenomenal book by a Harvard professor, Professor Ranjay Gulati, who actually, mm -hmm. you know, and I would say it's very affirmative of this founder led cultural phenomena and superordinate goals. And like it's about meaning creation. Right. It's not about an ESG target. It's about meaning creation. And your company can mean more than just a business or just a company or just a job. Like if your stakeholders refer to you in it's just a chances are you haven't you've missed the opportunity to create meaning. And, and it's not the easiest thing to do, right? As human beings, it is something we need to imagine as being something else that a company can be an agent of. Uh, and so, and I, I wouldn't go to your ad agency or PR firm because there's not a lot of evidence to suggest that they've got the answer for you. So start with yourself. Like what right. really matters to you as the founder of your small business or as the leader of a small business? What's an ideal you can personally get behind and see if you can orient your organization behind it? Mm -hmm. Now, to help small business owners with aligning their businesses with the human ideals, uh, Mike, how do you approach helping businesses identify and integrate these ideals into their core operations? Yeah. So the first step, really, you know, that list of companies that I rhymed off, you know, none of them become what they are without the founding individuals with Starbucks, without Howard Schultz and Southwest Airlines, without Herb Kellner, or Yvonne Schornard and Patagonia and so on. And so it's very tempting to actually miss the first step and just say, well, they were lucky to have one of those charismatic founder people like those people aren't made, they're born. So it's very easy to just say, well, it's a matter of good fortune to have a charismatic founder and an idealistic founder. But the truth is you can't expect the benefits, right? All of the 
invaluable human contribution of employees, customers, allies, vendors, media, all these stakeholders caring more, unless you actually have that fire of a founder. So like the first step is if you go through these 18 human ideals, which of the ones actually are at the intersection of what your company can do, the good people want to bring about in the world and you as the leader. So the first step is igniting a founder's fire. So even though you might not technically mm -hmm. be the chronological founder, what is that founder's movement that you want to start for this next chapter? And then the second step is create some structure around it. So uh, like when you look at those, founders do tend to behave in a very autocratic way. And it can either be in a tyrannical way or a benevolent way. But but they are arbiters of is that what our company what anytime a company is considering doing anything or a strategy, is that us or is it not us? Founders tend to be the ones to say yes and no. That's a very difficult structure to replicate. So you actually need to bring a CEO together with those stakeholder based functions, marketing, HR, corporate affairs, especially, and strategy, bring them together with the office of the CEO to create a reputation team or a purpose team. It doesn't really matter what you call it, but you need to create structure mm -hmm. to bring deep purpose into everything a company says and does. And the last one is measure it. Mm -hmm. Like it is once you get people, give people reason to care about a company, then measure the contributions they make. Are your employee, are you attracting the right type of employees? Are your innovation rates amongst your employees going up? Your productivity rates, your retention rates with your customers, are you getting a higher margin elasticity? Are you getting more referrals, loyalty? There are so many commercially beneficial behaviors that result when people care about your company, when your company truly matters. So, you know, ignite that founder's fire, create structure and human behavioral measurement. We would love to delve deeper into the value of common purpose, but your insights on uh, aligning businesses or businesses uh, practices with, uh, you know, human ideals is creating uh, or eliminating a path towards a more meaningful and more impactful corporate practices. Now, a shared purpose, as you mentioned, Mike, can really transform an organization uh, driving both internal cohesion and external support. What is that intrinsic value of a common purpose for a business and how does it really influence uh, stakeholder engagement? Yeah, perfect. Um, so as human beings, we do tend to, we're, we almost always reduce things to the commodity utility value of a thing. And you actually hear it in language, right? It's just a job. It's just a product. It's just a business. It's just a, and when we do that, essentially we're saying that company doesn't really matter to me. Mm -hmm. So the great value of illuminating that sense of meaning is that you actually really differentiate yourselves from competition because it's not, it's more than just a job. It's more, and it's something that your competitors will find extraordinarily difficult to replicate. The sense of meaning that people ascribe to your company, being a part of it, to feel as though they're a part of some change that they want to bring about in the world. And like companies have immense resources and influence compared to individuals and for us individuals, like very few of us are Greta Thunberg, Nelson Mandela, individuals who can shape the world by sheer force of will and personal uh, motivation. So when we see a company coming along and saying, hey, you know what, let's, I, I've got a love of wild places. I have a love of nature and our connectedness to nature, as Patagonia did. We're really quick to jump in behind them and say, oh, I want to be a part of that too. I want to be a part of the change that your company is bringing about. So... Uh, I, th I hope that answered that question. It really di did. I mean, understanding the value of a common purpose, uh, as you explained, can really equip businesses to build stronger relationships with all stakeholders. Uh, but we'd love to kind of hear some step-by-step -step guide, if you can, Mike. I mean, could you provide some practical steps that businesses can use to really define or refine uh, their common purpose? So I, I start with, like, it's so important to actually just get clarity of definition. Because that's where it's in most every company, like that stat mentioned earlier, 89% of CEOs saying, I've got a purpose statement. It's just not doing much of anything. Mm -hmm. So getting a really good, clear understanding of not just what it is, but what's the value it, it intends to contribute. So if you go to something like Deep Purpose, that Professor Gulati book, where it talks about its meaning creation, it's not. ESG, harms correction, carbon neutral by 2035. There are a lot of companies that have created statements that are 
I'd say very positive first steps of saying we want to be a part of a better world. But the great companies are very specific about the ideal that they've organized their company around. So just getting clear on the definition and the value is the most important part. I'd suggest the second step is uh, it's always easier to climb a mountain when you've got a good advisor. So if you can find some counselor, some advisor who actually has a reliable method, not just someone who's sort of good hearted and uh, reasonably smart, but someone who actually has a proven methodology of mm -hmm. getting up this particular mountain. I think those are two things that can really set you on a better path. Right. But these days, Mike, I mean, businesses today are increasingly expected to uh, lead change and contribute positively to the society, uh, embodying ideals that resonate on a human level. Um, how can companies orient themselves as agents of human ideals? And what impact does this orientation have? So the one thing I would suggest we not do and this tends to be the more common approach is to pick an issue that's topical in society and then suggest that your company is going to take a run at it or or help ameliorate it. Like companies are like, I, I actually, for anyone that suggests a company is anything other than an agent of profit growth, that's kind of what businesses are. So that is their purpose, mm -hmm. but they can have another organizing principle. And when you have a human ideal as your organizing principle, it actually guides where you should become activist. So it's not surprising that something like Patagonia, and we'll just go back to it as an example, and we can pick some others, um, but they didn't, they didn't start out by being a sustainability company or an environmental company. They started out with a guy who loved surfing and mountain climbing mm -hmm. and was in awe of the ocean and mountains and then said, oh, you know what, our planet, nature, Earth is kind of under assault and we should save our home planet. It When you start with the philosophy of a human ideal, it tells you where to become activist. So don't start with a political issue or a social issue and see how, what you can do about it. Start with a human ideal. What do you believe in? So similarly, like Starbucks is a self-respect, self-esteem, feel good about the individual company, nurture and inspire the human spirit. And when they had an incident that was very disrespectful to two individuals, they shut their company down to retrain an entire organization and, and reaffirm, we have to take care of the individual. We have to celebrate the individual. So they didn't pick, call it that issue of the moment, but they became activist around of it because of the human ideal, because of their belief system, if you will. Right. Now, Mike, um... I mean, what challenges my businesses face with this reorientation and how can they overcome them? I think one of the biggest challenges is back to clarity. So there are a lot of companies that I would suggest ran to, I need to be, I need to have a clean environmental record, social record, diversity, equity, inclusion. I have to have that all perfect. Mm -hmm. And in running to that, we all create risk because we're never going to be perfect on those things. And so when you come out and you start trumpeting, look at how great we are on our environmental track record or on our diversity, equity, on any of these ESG issues, you're never going to be perfect and you're never going to satisfy your most vocal credits. And so chances are it's actually quite predictable that when you go out saying, look at how great we are, that people will say, well, you haven't fixed this. You haven't fixed that. If you start with a human ideal, these things, so, you know, ideals are, they are shared conceptions. They, they don't exist. Mm -hmm. So things like taking care of loved ones, like as human beings, as a primate species, we're not a family-based species. We're a dominance hierarchy-based species. But we all, we, we're quite enamored as human beings with this concept of, well, you can have this small circle that we take care of. And, and so when you start with that, there is, so let's just play that out for a sec. There's no accomplishment of taking care of your loved ones. There's no day. Like, I'd like to think I'm a good dad and a good father and a good grandfather now. But there isn't a day where I feel like I did it. I'm the best dad I could ever be. I'm the best husband I could ever be. I'm the best grandfather I could ever be. There isn't a, it's not a goal to be achieved. It's something to rewardingly pursue throughout your time here. So when you say that's what our company stands for, it's actually a journey. It is something that you're always progressing. You can always demonstrate progress against it. And then you can talk about your ESG paths within that. 
Right. But if you start with the wrong one, if you start with your sort of report card on how great we are, um, that's really not going to cohere stakeholders the way an ideal can. I mean, perspectives really offer, I mean, perspective on businesses acting as uh, change uh, agents of change really offers a blueprint for businesses to really integrate that, um, I would say, corporate strategy into the societal contributions, which is which is great. But folks, let's pause to appreciate the depth of our discussion with Mike. It's quite clear that navigating the current business landscape it requires more than traditional strategies. It demands a profound connection with our shared human ideals. This episode isn't just a dialogue. It's an invitation to you, our listeners, to redefine what success looks like in business and society. How will you respond to this call to action? Um, before we conclude, Mike, could you share a final piece of advice for business leaders and entrepreneurs that are striving to align their operations with society ideals and fostering a culture of unity within the organization. Yeah, terrific. I, I think for every small business, it's it's wonderful if a small business wants to remain a small business for reasons of culture, for reasons of proximity to people and, and not wanting to grow behind beyond 150 because you feel like a family still. But if you're leading a, a small business that doesn't want to be a small business and you want to grow, one of the best ways to grow has always been giving people a reason to help you grow. So having people promote your company, customers or employees or anyone. And so that's always been a good way. It's increasingly a necessary way to win. Unless in this social media and tech-empowered general public era, you have your stakeholders wanting you to win and wanting to grow, you're probably not going to. But if you're mm -hmm. running a small business, one of the greatest assets you can create is idealism. Like what is the change we think our business can bring about in the world that gives reason to jump on our bandwagon, join in support and contribute to our success? Oh, Mike, thank you. It's been uh, an enlightening experience uh, to have you on the podcast today. I mean, your depth of knowledge on how businesses can really transform themselves with unity and purpose really offers an invaluable guidance for our listeners today. And so thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Maine. And that was the end of our discussion with Mike. This discussion not only sheds light on the importance of aligning business operations with societal ideals, but also serves as a call to action for leaders to drive meaningful change. To our dedicated audience, thank you for joining us on this thought-provoking journey. We hope that today's episode inspires you to consider the broader impact of your business decisions and the powerful role of unity in achieving success. We extend our heartfelt appreciation to all our partners, our exclusive banking partner, RBC, shipping partner, UPS, accounting software partner, Zero, and email partner, Constant Contact. Your support is crucial in bringing these vital conversations to the small business community. Listeners, don't forget to subscribe to the Canadian SME Small Business Magazine at canadiansme.ca for more insights, advice, and stories to fuel your entrepreneurial spirit.